Luke 17, verse 1, the words of Christ, it says, And then he said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. So take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, it was written on these pages by men who were inspired of your spirit to write them. And Lord, it meant something to them specifically in that day. But Lord, what I'm asking you to do today is to take these ancient words and Lord, by your ever-present spirit, make them modern realities to us. Help us to understand it, help us to grasp it, help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated this morning. One more time, turn to somebody and tell them good morning. Hallelujah. We're excited that each and every one of you have joined us this morning. God is good, and we're just excited to see what he does in this place amongst us. You know, last week we talked about the currency of trust, and what does it really look like to trust God with our resources, and what does our financial um, priority in our life, how does it really reflect our relationship with God? So if you haven't gone back and listened to that or made that available to yourself, go do that this morning, and it'll help you, uh, especially if you're struggling in that area. It's always a good refresher to be able to do that. Um, over the last couple of weeks, though, we've been looking at spiritual cardiology. We've been looking at the matters of our spiritual heart. You know, Jeremiah chapter 17 said that our heart was greatly wicked, deceitful. Who can know it? And the prophet Jeremiah was trying to tell us that our human condition, just unregenerate without Christ, is is always wishy-washy. We can say follow our heart, but how many of you know that your heart will tell you one day you love somebody and the next day it doesn't? Because our feelings, right, are based on roller coasters, up and down, up and down. So I don't care what Hallmark says or the Lifetime Channel says, you can't always trust or follow your heart. Your unregenerate heart will deceive you. Um, then we begin to talk about what does it look like to free ourselves from this burden of sin. We talked about repentance, getting our heart clean before God and why it's so important like David, when David was in impropriety with Bathsheba and he, he was a, a high ranking person, the most powerful man of all of Israel and then he found himself doing the unthinkable and one thing leading to another and his sin began to compound and multiply. And it wasn't until he received the word of the Lord from the prophet Nathan that David finally understood, okay, I'm the man, I've sinned, I need to ask for forgiveness. And the Lord was so eager to forgive him. I'm glad this morning that when we mess up, God is not, not keeping a tally score against us, that listen, we will have to pay for our sin, but if we ask Jesus to pay for it, God will forgive us, amen? And absolutely he will. He's so merciful and just to wash away our iniquities. So we talked about having that repentant attitude. Last week, as I mentioned, we talked about you know, how does the matters of our heart look concerning our generosity? But this week, I want to look at something totally different. Totally different. Intense, yes, but totally different. This morning, I want to talk to you about the subject of unforgiveness. I want to talk to you about the subject of unforgiveness. If you're writing notes today and you've made yourself a place to write a title, I want to give you the, the message this morning, this title, Setting the Captive Free. 
Setting the captive free. Uh, I would guess today that each and every one of us have dealt with the subject of unforgiveness at one point in our life or another. Am I right about that? We all have. We've all struggled with it. We're all human. We've all dealt with offense and we've been wounded. We've allowed things to embitter our hearts and we've had to have God deal with us in such a way so that we can get free from that. Or perhaps there's some of you in this room this morning that are still carrying the bitterness of wounds of things that are long ago in the past. And perhaps God just wants to set you free today from this bitterness which is called unforgiveness. I've entitled this message Setting the Captive Free because oftentimes when we forgive somebody, we feel like we are letting them off the hook for what they've done to us. Maybe they've hurt you. Maybe there was molestation or or rape or abandonment. Maybe there were father wounds, absentee parents. Maybe there was physical trauma. Maybe there was some type of issue, spiritual abuse that happens at times. Maybe there was a friend who caused you to lose trust. And there's all of these issues that you are carrying and you say, You don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand how they made me feel. You don't understand the pain and the burden of what I've gone through. And so we justify oftentimes our feelings of what we are carrying on the inside. But what we don't realize is is that when we make a choice to forgive somebody who has offended us or wounded us, we are actually the captive that's being set free. Amen? Oh, see, I need to say that again because some of you act like you didn't understand what I said. Because the old adage says that holding unforgiveness towards somebody is like you drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Listen, when you choose to hold on to the unforgiveness and the pain of yesterday, what happens is, is that you are imprisoning yourself. Because the wound from unforgiveness turns into anger. It turns into resentment. It turns into bitterness. It turns into frustration. And what was once now this little thing has now escalated into this big thing. And before you know it, you find yourself in a serious place of bondage. You can't function normally in life because everything reminds you of it. Nobody can get close to you because every time they get close to you, you're, you're worried about the same thing happening to you that somebody else did. There's some people in this room this morning, you're having difficulties in marriage because you've not been healed from the last season that you were in. And nobody can get close to you even if they're trying to do you right because you're carrying the wounds of unforgiveness from the past. I want you to know something, that when we make a choice to forgive others, we are literally opening the door to the prison cell in our own hearts, and we're allowing ourselves to be set free. Jesus wants us to do this type of thing, amen? Now, I'm going to show you some things this morning that I believe will be revolutionary to you, but they're, they're elementary, but I pray the light bulb will go off. You know, when you're talking about being unforgiving, what does that really mean? I looked it up in the dictionary, and according to Merriam-Webster, here's what the definition for unforgiving was. Number one, it was the uh, unwilling or unable to forgive. The second one is this, having or making no allowance for error or weakness. I want to say that one again because I think we all know what the first one means. But I want us to look at the second one when it deals with the the definition for unforgiving. It means having or making no allowance for error or weakness. What that means is is that when we choose to to, to forgive somebody, we are not making allowances for the imperfections in other people's lives. Now, that's difficult Because all of us have imperfections. And all of us want people to forgive us when we we do them wrong. Are we not? Is that not the truth? We all want people to forgive us when they do us wrong. But we want them to pay for their mistakes. We want want to crucify them for their actions, but we want to be judged by our motives. 
right? But here's the thing this morning. Unforgiveness hurts us more than we ever could even realize. It's a state of emotional and mental distress that results from a delayed response in forgiving an offender. It's characterized by, notice this, indignation, bitterness, and a demand for punishment or restitution. In other words, look at this. Unforgiveness is a state of emotional and mental distress, notice, that results from a delayed response in forgiving. A delayed response in forgiving. In other words, the definition here is not denying the fact that offenses come. The scripture we're going to see in a moment doesn't deny that either. But what unforgiveness does is that it, it becomes this gnarly monster whenever we refuse to be instantaneous in our forgiving people against their trespasses. And so when we refuse to forgive, we're making a choice to imprison ourselves but here's the thing, folks. How many of us are walking around with wounded souls because of what somebody else has done to us? How many of us are walking around hurt, not whole, because of what somebody has done to us? This morning, I've not come to minimize or nullify the pain or trauma that you have gone through. But what I am trying to get you to understand this morning is this simple fact, that there's healing and there's restoration and there's reconciliation that is found no other than in the cross of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the only person who can make all wrongs right. And he can heal the wounded heart, the, the bitter soul. He can restore that to a point to where you can be functional again. He can restore that to the point to where you can even look the person in the face. And even though you may not restore them to the place they once were, not in allowing them to hurt you in that way again, but you still can forgive them to the point to where you don't feel enraged every time you think about them. Can I give you a big litmus test on whether or not you've forgiven somebody? You can say it all you want to, but how do you feel when their name comes across your cell phone screen? How do you feel when you see them at the family reunion? How do you feel when you clock in at work in the morning. You can say, bless God, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. But the moment you see that person and all of that inflames again in your heart, it is another indication that that thing has not truly died yet. And the Bible tells us in this passage this morning that oftentimes forgiveness is not a one-time, one-and-done, but a process in which we walk through so that we can get free in our lives. Amen. And so this morning, if you're taking notes, I, I want to begin to talk to you about this, but go back with me to Luke 17 and let's exegete this passage. Luke 17 verse 1 Jesus is talking. It says, and then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. For it would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. So then he says in verse three, take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And notice this, verse 5, it says, And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Can, can I give that to you in modern day English? Lord, that's difficult to handle. 
That's difficult to handle. Jesus is saying, look, if your brother offends you, not a stranger, if your brother offends you, and he comes and he asks for forgiveness, you forgive him. If he does it seven times in the same day, you come back, he comes back and says, forgive me. You're to forgive him. And Jesus is like, boys, do you have that? They said, increase our faith. This is too much, Lord, to handle. Why is that interesting this morning? It's interesting because it shows us the process. And then notice what the Lord said in verse 6. And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, the, the King James, the original says the sycamine tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Interesting to me when we look at this passage. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, you ready? Very simple. Mark it down. You will have an opportunity to be offended. You will have an opportunity to be offended. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Offense is a trap. It's a trap that's been set. Offended, though, is a choice. You can't help the offense, but you can help to continue to be offended. It's a trap. you got to choose not to let this thing entangle you because it's not hurting anybody but you. But listen, you will have an opportunity to be offended. Now, here's the thing about being offended. Some people offend you on accident. Other people offend you on purpose. I have been offended before. I didn't stay that way, but I mean, I was offended. Been in Walmart, and I was trying to talk to somebody, and they're just like, oh, okay, 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 all right, see you later. And I'm like, man, they, they didn't even want to talk to me. Now, I didn't know what they were having to rush off for, or what they might be going through at home, or whatever you see. I'm just reading into that and allowing myself to get offended. That person wasn't trying to offend me on purpose. And I see some of you shaking your head, because the truth is we've all been there. We've all been there. Do you remember the old saying, give somebody the benefit of the doubt? We got to get back to that. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, we got to start giving them the benefit of the doubt. We, we, you know, our, our first, our first uh, impression should be, they must be having a bad day instead of, well, they just don't like me. You know, we've got to make sure that we're guarding our hearts. Notice we're talking about spiritual cardiology today. We will have an opportunity to be offended. It could be on accident. It, I, don't, I don't mean to let the cat out of the bag here, but it could be on purpose. Because some people are mean. There are some people that are mean. <clears throat> I got another one for you. They're not all found in the bars. Church is made up of people who are broken, who need Jesus. All of them are at different places in their life. Some people have been in the way a long time. Some people have just gotten in the way. Some people are, you know, just starting out in their journey. Some people are here and they don't even know why they're here, but they're here. And, and we've got to know this, that sometimes people are mean. I'll never forget when Pastor Blonnie and I were newly married and we were just started going to this church. And, and you know, I don't know. I, I was always taught, now don't let this offend you. See, I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice here, okay? We were always taught by my youth pastor, you don't sit in the back, especially if you're easily distracted, because I don't have time to sit back there trying to see if you're picking your nose or if you're giving in the offering or what you're looking at on your phone because if I'm doing that, I can't be focused on worshiping Jesus. I can't be focused on listening to what the preacher's saying. So we always sat towards the front. Well, 
bless the Lord, came in one day, sat our Bible down, and didn't realize I sat it in somebody's spot. There wasn't a reserve sign there. But when I went to sit back down, my stuff was G-O-N-E, gone with the wind. And when we went and asked about it, they weren't very nice about it. You'll have an opportunity to be offended. Sometimes offenses are on purpose, sometimes they're not. Here's the next thing. Sometimes they are by people who are extremely close to you. Parents can be offended by their kids. You don't believe me? Thankfully, my kids have never done this, and I hope they don't ever. So I'm not using them as an illustration today. Parents get mad at their kids and say, I hate you. Bro, there ain't nothing that hurts worse. Nothing. You start thinking like Fred Sanford. I brought you into this world, and I'll take you out, and I'll make another one just... Okay, see, last week I preached about crucifying the old man. See, he halfway came up. Y'all pray for me today, okay? All right. So you will have an opportunity to be offended. Parents can be offended by their kids. Kids can be offended by their parents. Parents, listen, I've had to deal with this before and eat crow with my own children. The Bible says fathers don't exasperate your children to wrath. Sometimes you can be too harsh. Okay? Spouses can offend each other. If you don't believe that, stay married. The epitome of love is a choice is marriage. Because anybody in this room that's been married longer than two months will tell you that warm and fuzzy feeling, it ain't always there. It's not always there. It's not always there when they take the covers in the middle of winter. It's not always there when they leave the cap off the toothpaste bottle. It's not always there. When you have expectations that are unspoken and you get frustrated because you never say, okay, okay, I'm going to stop now. We do have a marriage small group. Hello, somebody. If you need to go, see Sheldon Meliza. Praise the Lord. You can be offended. You can be offended by a teacher. You can be offended by your pastor. You can be offended by all types of people. But mark this down. If you're breathing, you will have a living, breathing opportunity to be offended. It is going to happen. And I want you to notice the words of Jesus in Luke 17, verse 1. He says, it is impossible that offenses will not come. Can I tell you why that's the truth? Because we're not robots. We're not robots. We all have our own personalities. We all have our own preferences. We all have our own baggage that we bring into life. One person was raised this way. Another person was raised that way. And another person is grace-oriented. And another person is, is very black and white-oriented. And, and it takes everybody to make the world go around. But the truth is, Jesus says, it is impossible to live this life and not be offended. But then I want you to see what he says next. Notice this. He says, but woe, go back to verse one, but woe to him through whom they do come. So point number one was this. Number one, you will have an opportunity to be offended. Point number two is this. We should strive not to offend others. Listen, Certainly, I'm not talking about biblical truth, 
because I could get up here and open the Bible, and I've done it week after week. I can open this Bible right here and read a passage about divorce, adultery, homosexuality, stealing, whatever, and add no commentary to it, and somebody would be offended because truth is offensive. So I'm not talking about watering down the truth, but this morning I am talking about we should strive not to offend others in our personality or how we respond to them or how we speak to them. You know, language is very powerful. But can I tell you something? Not all language is verbal. Not all language is verbal. There's a reason why the saying is so true. If looks could kill. Because listen, you can communicate to me without ever saying a word. In fact, there was a country song that communicated that very well because she said, you say it best when you say nothing at all. There's a look. Whether good or bad, the posture of the hands, the features of the face, the way we stand, I can tell when I walk up to you if I know you or not. And I said, okay, let me move to this side. We should strive to not offend other people. Lord, have mercy. We have to work on this. Let me rewind that. Lord, have mercy. I need to work on this. Because my, my nature is very passionate. Passionate, okay? A lot of people think, why is Pastor Brass so mad? If you ever got around me outside of right here, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm very chill. It's passion. But I've tried to understand how to not make passion look so mad sometimes. Let me tell you, I do get mad. I get mad that the devil dupes Christians into being lukewarm. I, I get mad that the devil has lullabied people to sleep. I get mad that our high schools and middle schools are overrun with perversion and, and, and idolatry and, and all types of ungodliness. I get mad about it, but listen, I, I, that doesn't mean I don't love those people, I love them so much, I want them to know the truth, the passion, to not want anybody to die lost, so important. But we got to strive not to offend people on purpose. Listen, how we react and how we respond matters. Jesus said we should strive not to offend. How we live matters. I want to go a little bit further in that verse. Look at this with me. In verse number two, this, this is powerful. Anybody that thinks Jesus was weak, emaciated, and he wasn't blunt, obviously has not read the Bible. Look at what Jesus said. It would be better, talking about offense, it would be better for a person if a millstone was hung around his neck and thrown into the sea, then he should offend one of these little ones. Now, don't let your mind drift too far one way that you don't understand what the, the writer's trying to say here. When we think of little ones, we think of just little children. And certainly Jesus was implying those who were little, because he said, suffer not the little ones to come unto me. But Jesus also said that if we are to come to him, we are to come to him with the faith as of a child. And he's also dealing with new believers here. And sometimes, help me Holy Ghost, sometimes seasoned Christians mean well, 
but they can say things in such an ugly way that they can cause little ones in their faith to walk away from the faith. And Jesus said, it is so dangerous to do that. It would be better for you if you took a, a big uh, anvil and jumped off a bridge somewhere. Jesus said that. Jesus said, don't offend people on purpose. Interesting. Powerful stuff. We ought to strive to react the right way and respond the right way. Here's the third one. I want you to continue to look in our text with us. Verse number three. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. When he says take heed, what that means is stop, pause, self-evaluate. Stop, pause, self-evaluate. Take heed to yourselves. And then notice what he says here. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Notice that. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now, this is tough. Point number one is we're all going to have opportunities to be offended. Second thing I share with you is that we should strive not to offend others. But here's the third thing. We should seek reconciliation. Now, this is about to get tough. Go back with me to Luke 17. And I want you to look at verse 3 again. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. He didn't say talk about him. He said rebuke him. The word rebuke there is it's a strong word. And, and oftentimes we we think of it in the terms of, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But the, the, the word rebuke, it, it means to correct. It means to correct. You see, I, I want you to know something. That while the Bible teaches us that if somebody hits you on one side, you turn the other cheek and offer the other side. But the, the Bible is, is trying to use hyperbole there to, to describe the attitude of a believer in suffering. But in passages like this, I want, you to, I want to show you that Jesus is trying to tell us that if somebody sins against us, that doesn't make us a Christian doormat. So many people think that you should just let people treat you terrible or treat you bad and never say anything. That's not what Jesus said. Notice what he said right here. If your brother, now here he's not talking about just the biological brother because in the sense he's talking about brotherhood as it relates to the faith, the household of faith, Christians, other believers. If your brother offends you, if he sins against you, rebuke him. In other words, if he hurt you, if she hurt you, tell him about it. Tell them about it. You know why that's important? Because if you don't, that unwillingness to deal with the problem begins to compound. And that offense begins to turn into unforgiveness. And then it turns to bitterness and rage and those things have all types of spiritual and physical consequences in your life. So notice this. Somebody offends you, you should seek reconciliation. Hey, I don't like the way you spoke to me. Hey, did I do something to you? Let's talk about it. Let's work it out. 
Because guess what? If not, it grows and it grows and it grows. And here's what we do. The enemy gets into our mind and we begin to replace scenarios. And we begin to build a case. And then all of a sudden, our brother or our sister becomes an enemy. And doesn't that sound like Satan? He wants to conquer and divide the family, both physically and spiritually. And so what happens is, is that he says, if, if he sins against you, he says, rebuke him. Bring it out in the open. You know, this is not the only place that the Bible talks about this. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus uses the same illustration, but in a different way. He says, if a brother offends you, he says, go to him and him alone. Deal with it one-on-one. Don't go get five or six other people and make them form an opinion about that person. And then you, in, in psychology, it's called triangulation. You've already built a case against the other person. And, and all of a sudden now, you're not, you're not trying to, to, to win an argument. You're trying to build a team. You're trying to build a team. And, and so he, he says, if your brother sins against you, Matthew 18, you go to him. And if they repent, then you've received a brother. You've been restored. He says, if they don't hear you, then go take one other person with you. Because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So that way, nobody will be able to say, they didn't try to make it right. They didn't try to do the right thing. And so you deal with it. And then, he says, if they won't listen to you, then there's a way to deal with that. But here, what Jesus is dealing with is the erring brother that sins against us. We need to go and make that situation right It's reconciliation. It's reconciliation. It's so important, isn't it? We got to seek that out. Listen, I I I want to share I want to share something a little vulnerable this morning, but I just felt impressed to do this. You know, this this is something that that I have wrestled with. Um, a, A few moments ago, I talked about. What, is it, what does it look like? You think you've forgiven somebody, but then when their name pops up on the phone or when you see them in person, then all of these feelings come back and you're like, oh, I'd rather just not deal with this person. You know, that's the very same situation I found myself in with my father. Because for 18 years of my life, he was absent. Right after we got married, didn't hear from him, see from him any. My kids didn't know who he was. He didn't come to the hospital when they were born. One was eight hours away, the other was 20 miles. No birthdays, no Christmases, no Thanksgivings. He went to all his new wife's stuff, all her kids, and here I am. I'm like, God, man, I'm a pastor serving God, man. Like, what's the deal? And I'll tell you, I'm, I, in, my, in my mental ascent, I made a conscious effort to say with my mouth, and this is a, probably a good first step, Lord, I forgive them. And I even sent cards on Christmas, cards on Father's Day, all of that stuff. Did I feel like it? No. But I was here and he was over there somewhere. Right? In my heart, I'm good. Fast forward 18 years, his wife dies. He finds out she's not the woman he thought she was. He has a realization. I've neglected my grandkids for 18 years. I've not been in my son's life for 18 years. 
And now, listen, I'm just being honest with you. Is this okay? Can I be honest with you? Because if you don't want a real preacher, I'll go somewhere else, okay? I don't know how to do anything else but to be honest. I'm like, okay, listen. Now this guy I hadn't heard from in 18 years wants to call me five times a week. And I'm not handling it too well. In my mind, I'm like, God, I'm good. I forgave him. But I had a very wise person call me. And they had a word from the Lord. And they said, you need to go to that funeral. Because God's going to do something amazing. And let me tell you what happened. I wasn't four hours down the road from coming home when miracle after miracle began to happen. And now, that relationship with my dad, it's like it never happened. God totally restored it. Now, why am I saying all that? I'm telling you, it's not easy. That's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. I'm not up here selling you some popcorn and Coke religion that's so easy that you just got to say it and all your feelings go away and all of that stuff. No, no, no. I'm talking about real life stuff you have to work with. The honest to God truth this morning is this. There are people in your life that you have walked, that have walked out on you. There are husbands and wives who have left you for somebody else. There is uh, somebody who has betrayed you and hurt you. And you're dealing with the same thing this morning. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. If God can restore and forgive and make it like it never happened, he can do the same thing in your life. That is exactly what can happen. I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. The point of all that was this. You can think you've dealt with something and have not really dealt with it. Now I look forward to him calling. You gotta seek reconciliation. And I'm about to be done this morning. Number four, you ready? We should make a choice up front. We should just go ahead and do this to just be unoffendable. We should make a choice to be unoffendable. Notice what Jesus said here. He said, if he sins against you seven times a day and seven times he returns to you saying, Lord, I uh, I repent. He says, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, You can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Jesus said, it's not going to be easy. But you do need to have faith. Jesus said, you see this mulberry tree? See this sycamine tree? You need to say to it, be plucked up and pulled out. And he said it would obey you. What does that mulberry tree represent? It represents unforgiveness. It it represents that thing. See, I, I don't believe whatsoever that Jesus chose this particular illustration for this particular moment. You know why? Because a mulberry tree and a fig tree are not the same. They look the same. In fact, if you were to pull up a Strong's Concordance and look up the phrase mulberry tree, it actually comes back sycamine. And a sycamine tree has a fig. It looks like a fig, but they're extremely bitter to eat. This tree grows bitter fruit. Can I tell you what unforgiveness leads to? It leads to bitterness. Not only that, but... A sycamine tree is only pollinated one way, by the sting of a wasp. And so, the more it's stung, 
the more it grows. I'll tell you, that's how a fence is. The more it's poked, the more the infection grows, right? The more you deal with it. Here, here's an interesting thing. Sycamine tree, sycamine wood is the number one wood used in Israel in the Middle East to make caskets out of. Because so much death is associated with unforgiveness. Folks, I got one more passage for you today, and it's not on the screen. Sound team, forgive me. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. I want to show you why it's so important to keep this switch of forgiveness turned on in your own life. Mark 11, I want to look at verse 22, and we're going to read down through here for just a moment. Mark eleven twenty-two. 22, these are the words of Jesus. He says, and so he answered, and he said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you that whosoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but he believes those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Jesus is speaking to them about faith and how faith works. We're to speak and believe and be persuaded of what God says. But listen, oftentimes we quit reading before the thought is over. Look at verse 25, it's connected. And whenever you stand praying, notice Jesus had just said, when you pray, believe you receive it and you have it. And then notice he says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything, somebody say anything. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you of your trespasses. But look at the next verse. But if you do not forgive, neither your Father in heaven will forgive your trespasses. Unforgiveness binds the hands of God. I'll never forget years ago, I, I heard John Bevere teach on this. Unforgiveness binds the hands of God. In other words, when you are holding somebody in a position of unforgiveness, you are literally binding God's hands. And, and, and essentially God says, if you want to handle it, handle it yourself then. But the moment you choose to forgive, it releases your faith. Faith works by love, not unforgiveness. The moment we release our captive, not only do we forgive them, but God releases his wave of forgiveness towards us. See, for some of you, that messes you up right there this morning because you think you can just treat people any way you want to and it doesn't matter to God. That's not what the scripture says. It matters how you treat people because people were made in the image of God. And there's not a person that we ever will run into face to face, eyeball to eyeball, that was not made in the image of God. There's not one person, doesn't matter where they came from, doesn't matter what they look like, doesn't matter how much money they have, what color they are, or where they grew up. You will never lock eyeballs with a person who was not created in the image of God whom Jesus did not give his life for. And Jesus said, in my own paraphrase here, how dare you expect my forgiveness when you can't give it to other people? Hello. I want us all to stand in this room this morning. And I don't want anybody leaving if you don't have to. If it's an emergency, I understand. Folks, this morning, this message is so serious. <clears throat> I 
Sometimes I don't like sharing things so personal. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is your testimony is to help other people overcome. And if you keep it to yourself, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help anybody. So my question to you this morning is this. I have two. The first one, number one, what's hurting you? What's hurting you? I'll tell you, it's okay to be hurt. It's not okay to camp out there. Folks, weeping endures for a night. Scripture acknowledges that there's tears. But the Bible says, but joy comes in the morning. Some of you have been in a season, an extended season of pain, of unforgiveness. I feel a prophetic unction on me this morning. Some of you have been in, in an extreme season of, of heartache. And, and the Lord this morning is trying to shine a light on your heart health. And you say, Lord, how come I feel like my prayers are not being answered? How, how come it, it's because you hadn't forgiven your father? You've not forgiven your mother. You've not forgiven that spouse. This morning, the question is, who hurt you? And my statement to you is this. Let Jesus heal it.